Good evening. Let's discuss pathological myopia today. So how do you define myopia? Myopia is defined as a refractive error wherein parallel rays of light which are coming from infinity come to focus in front of the neurosensory layer of the retina with accommodation being at rest. So as you can see in this image, light which is coming from infinity from the right side of the screen is coming to a focus in front of the neurosensory layer of the retina. There are four clinical types of myopia that are classically described. First is congenital, which is obvious in its explanation, present since birth. Second is simple or developmental myopia, which, <coughs> which is also called school myopia because it occurs in age group of 8 to 12 in the school going age group. Third is pathological and fourth is acquired and the acquired means it is acquired by some other cause. So amongst these, we are going to be discussing pathological myopia today. So how is pathological myopia different from the other types of myopia? Firstly, pathological myopia shows a very rapid progression. Hence, it is also called as progressive myopia. It has a very early onset, which is on an average 5 to 10 years of age, which is earlier as compared to simple myopia, which is usually about 8 to 12 years of age. The degree of myopia is very high. Sometimes it can go as high as 20 to 25 diopters. Whereas in simple myopia, it is usually less than or equal, uh, less than six diopters. And pathological myopia is always associated with degenerative changes in the retina, in the posterior pole basically. Hence, it is also known as a degenerative myopia. So it has three names, pathological, progressive and degenerative. So what causes pathological myopia? The basic problem is that there is a rapid increase in the axial length of the eyeball. And this is beyond the biological variation, beyond the normal zone, the margin of error that can be seen. One millimeter increase in the axial length produces a myopia of about three diopters. So there are certain theories that have been proposed. We do not exactly know why certain people are more predisposed to having pathological myopia and why certain people are not. But heredity has been one of the reasons that has been implied such that there is a familial incidence. Families show a high incidence of pathological myopia. And secondly, racial reasons have also been put forth. So this, this pathological myopia is seen more often in Chinese, Japanese, Arabs and Jews, and less commonly in African Americans. The third reason why heredity is implicated is because there is a sex linked progression of the disease. Females are more likely to be affected than males. And the second mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant where chromosomes 18 and 12 are affected. 18 is affected more commonly than chromosome 12. The second theory is a general growth theory. Every tissue in the body starts growing as a single cell. So when it, is, when it keeps growing, there has to be a stoppage somewhere where this growth is arrested and the normal shape and the structure of the tissue is attained. Sometimes it so happens that these factors that control the growth of the tissue are absent or are deficient. So there is an overshoot of the growth of tissue. So, so normally the eyeball that has to be globular now becomes oval with an elongated structure with an increase in the axial length. These factors are very often deficient as a form of nutritional deficiency or chronic debilitating diseases such as anemia or immunocompromised state. Regardless of which theory you hold on to, either hereditary or general growth, there is a retinal growth that is stimulated because of an elongated eyeball. The retinal cells can proliferate, so can the sclera, so a scleral growth can also occur. But the choroid cannot grow, choroid cannot stretch and therefore a st an attempted stretch of the choroid produces choroidal degeneration. When the choroid degenerates, the retina will also degenerate because remember that the outer four layers of the retina are supplied by the choroid, the choroidal circulation. So if the choroid undergoes degeneration, the retina also undergoes a degeneration. And when the retinal degeneration happens, the vitreous also undergoes liquefaction and a further degeneration. All throughout this process, the actual length of the eyeball is progressively increasing. And this gives rise to the entity known as pathological myopia. Understand that a very important concept of the disuse atrophy of ciliary muscle. The role of ciliary muscle is to produce accommodation and accommodation comes into play when light is coming to a focus behind the retina, when there is a hypermetropic state. 
But in myopia, when light is coming to a focus in front of the neurosensory layer of the retina, accommodation is never stimulated. So the ciliary muscle, like any other muscle of the body, starts going undergoing atrophy due to a disuse. So this phenomenon is known as disuse atrophy of the ciliary muscle. Let us discuss certain clinical features that the patient may present with. Firstly, let's, let us look at the symptoms. There will be a decrease in vision, which will be gradual, painless and progressive. The severity will be very high in the sense that many a times patient will present to you with vision such as counting fingers at 1 meter or counting fingers at 2 meter. And this vision is uncorrectable by any means. No spectacle, no contact lens is able to correct this vision beyond a particular point. The second symptom that the patient presents with is floaters, also known as musque volitantes. This is basically vitreous degeneration. The vitreous undergoes liquefaction and it starts appearing like floating strands in front of the eye. So this phenomenon is called floater. And thirdly, and one of the earliest symptoms of pathological myopia is night blindness. What signs will you look for in a case of pathological myopia? Very first, the patient will present to you with an exophthalmos-like appearance. This is because the actual length of the eyeball has increased and this will be more obvious if the condition is unilateral. Because understand that this elongation of the eyeball is happening posterior to the equator. The structures anterior to the equator are by and large normal. So if this condition is bilateral, it will be very difficult to tell just on a cursory examination whether this is exophthalmos or not. The cornea will appear large because the axial length has now increased and so will the anterior chamber appear deeper. The refractive error by various methods that you might calculate either by auto refractometry or by retinoscopy or by manual refractive correction, best corrected visual acuity that you give, any method you use doesn't matter. The error of refraction will be about 10 to 20 diopters. Certain cases it may even be more than 20 diopters. Very classical fundus changes that you can see. Firstly, and the most obvious one will be an optic disc pallor. The optic disc will appear pale, it will appear whiter than normal. You will see a temporal crescent, also known as a choroidal show. So, what basically is this temporal crescent? So, if you can see, this is the disc, this is the retina of the left eye. So, if this is the left eye, that means the disc is present nasally and the macula will be present temporally. So the white region that you can see, the white crescent, the C shape that you can see is actually the sclera that you can see. The choroid is being attempted to stretch but because of its inelastic nature, it does not stretch, it gives way and separates from the optic disc. So consequently the white strip that you see is actually the sclera which is underlying the choroid. Choroidal tessellation is another sign that you see. So this is basically thinning of the choroid because of a stretch. And when the choroid stretches and thins out, the underlying blood vessels that are present within it start becoming prominent. So all these wavy, you know, blurry blood vessels that you see, those are of the choroid and the sharper delineated blood vessels superficially seen are of the retina. Such a fundus is also known as a tigroid fundus. The next sign that you see is chorioretinal atrophy with white patches. So why is there a chorioretinal atrophy? Because of a chronic stretch, a chronic thinning of the choroid as well as the retina. So what do those white patches represent? Those white patches are again the underlying sclera that you can see because of, of the degeneration of the structures lying above it. A very classical feature seen in pathological myopia is a foster fuchs spot. So foster fuchs spot occurs at the macula and it represents two things. First of all, it represents a choroidal hemorrhage which is because of a stretch of the choroid, the blood vessels rupture and there is a localized hemorrhage in the macular area. And secondly, because there is an ischemia of the choroid now, because of the hemorrhage, there is going to be sub-retinal neovascularization. Both these features together constitute the foster fuchs spot. There are other non-classical and you know non-specific degenerative signs such as cystoid, lattice and snail track lesion. These are more commonly seen as a part of retinal detachment. The next sign that you see is a posterior staphyloma. So any st a staphyloma is the protrusion of uveal tissue through thinned out coats of the eyeball. So the our overlying sclera, choroid and the retina have thinned out through which the uveal tissue is trying to penetrate. So such a condition is called posterior staphyloma. Why posterior? Because it is occurring posterior to the equator. 
very classical sign in on sign seen on B scan B scan ultrasonography I want you to look at the superior uh, you know above image and compare it with the lower image look at the contour of the eyeball in the above image it appears as though the eyeball is elongated posteriorly and in the lower image it is perfectly circular so the above image represents posterior staphyloma and the below one is a normal USGB scan Vitreous opacities can also be seen. These may be representative of floaters or it may be a fresh vitreous hemorrhage. Both fundoscopy and B scan are useful to detect vitreous opacities. And finally, a sign called accentuated foveal reflex is seen. So fovea is at the center of the macula, that is the point of highest visual acuity. This point is also the brightest in the retina because it is a depression, it is a pit and light that is reflect, reflecting off it is going to appear brighter than the surrounding tissue. In case of pathological myopia, this foveal reflex that you see, the light reflex you see, is going to be appearing even brighter. What investigations will you do in a case of pathological myopia? B scan ultrasonography, of course, you would like to perform to rule out posterior staphyloma. Perimetry can be performed, in which case a generalized visual field contraction is seen, also known as isopteric contraction. Scotomas may also be seen if there is a localized destruction of the retinal tissue. Electroretinogram, which primarily tests the function of rods and cones, is going to be subnormal. What complications are you expecting in a case of pathological myopia? First and foremost, a retinal detachment can occur. Secondly, a complicated cataract. So why will there be a complicated cataract? This is because some amount of lens nutrition is taken care of by the vitreous. And now if the vitreous is undergoing degeneration, lens nutrition also suffers. So there is a development of cataract. And any cataract that is due to a secondary change in the eyeball elsewhere, say for example a uveitis, or in this case a vitreous liquefaction is going to be called a complicated cataract. Thirdly, vitreous hemorrhage can occur because some of the neovascularization can enter the vitreous and when the vitreous degenerates, these blood vessels are going to rupture and produce a hemorrhage. Finally, a choroidal hemorrhage can be seen for obvious reasons. The choroid is getting stretched and thinned out. Some of the blood vessels may rupture. How do you manage a case of pathological myopia? First of all, you treat it like any other case of myopia and try optical correction, which is to provide concave lenses or minus or diverging lenses. Light is coming to a focus in front of retina. You need to diverge the light and bring it to a focus on the retina. A concept of minimum for maximum is followed, which means minimum correction, which gives maximum visual equity is to be given for the patient. If the myopia is of a high degree, which means more than six diopters, the patient may not immediately accept the correction. So you under correct it by some degree and gradually increase the correction until full myopia is corrected. Always remember, never ever correct, uh, I'm sorry, never ever over correct myopia. If you overcorrect myopia, the light which was supposed to fall on the retina is going to overshoot and come to a focus behind the retina. Now what will happen is you will stimulate the accommodation of the patient and force that light to come on focus on the retina. So you will chronically stimulate the accommodation and this patient will may uh, you know have symptoms of fatigue, symptoms of asthenopia. Secondly, the problem in myopic patients and especially in high myopic patients is that their accommodation has not been active for very long because light has been continuously coming to a focus in front of the retina so their accommodation has not been very active so suddenly if you overcorrect such a patient his accommodation is not going to be able to compensate so your refractive correction is not going to be useful so never overcorrect the patient if at all you need to make an error always undercorrect spectacles or contact lenses are two of the commonest you know modalities for optical rehabilitation contact lenses are better preferred especially in cases of higher degrees of myopia which is more than six diopters because it avoids the problem of minification of images that are formed low vision aids can be utilized so two of the commonest low vision aids that are used are magnifying lenses to increase the size of the object that can be seen and image displacers for example what do i mean by image displacers suppose there is an area of the retina that is damaged then I will divert the light from that area to an area that is functioning such that at least there is some amount of functional vision that the patient can be seen. Low vision aids can never give you 
you know satisfactory vision the, the vision provided by them can never be as good as spectacles and contact lenses but it gets the job done and gives a functional amount of vision where spectacles and contact lenses are not very useful surgical methods are also uh, you know utilized in case of pathological myopia but they are not as useful as compared to the other types of myopia and the reason for that is most of the surgical procedures for myopia involve some alteration of the corneal curvature and corneal thickness the problem in pathological myopia is in the posterior segment in the posterior pole so no matter how much manipulation you make in the cornea there is always a chance that the disease could recur because pathological myopia is going to progress until date there is not much effective surgical procedure available to you know slow down the process of this pathological myopia however one one process has been found to be very promising and that is posterior scleral reinforcement with fascia lata so you basically take multiple strips of fascia lata and suture it over the posterior sclera to try and reinforce the eyeball and thus it will try to slow down the enlargement of the eyeball of course you need to perform a laser or a cryotherapy as a prophylaxis to prevent retinal detachment so these are prophylactically given on the retina to prevent any further detachment and uh, you know any further complications of the myopia can you prevent pathological myopia to an extent yes and by prevention i do not mean the prevention of the disease i mean a uh, prevention of the progression i can halt and try to slow down the progression of pathological myopia so as to maintain vision and two of the commonest drugs that are used are atropine and pirenzepine pirenzepine is an m1 selective agent and has to be and has been found to be more effective protein and vitamin supplements again are you know considered to be uh, kind of uh, you know additional means to control the disease visual hygiene so what do i mean by visual hygiene it is basically use of appropriate illumination appropriate posture so those kind of uh, modalities help in maintaining the vision and finally genetic counseling so if there are two individuals of pathological myopia who suffer from pathological myopia they are advised not to get married and procreate simple uh, simple reason there is a genetic component to pathological myopia and you do not want the offspring to have a higher chance of the disease so that takes care of pathological myopia in brief please leave your suggestions questions queries in the comment section below please follow us on instagram and i.xl subscribe to our channel and also follow our facebook page we'll be posting regular updates as always thanks for watching stay safe and good night